spinning view unbelievable view. how long have you been spinning collecting there. gear some more over there oh man probably maybe 25 years something like that wow maybe longer you know I me mean? like I, I hear a record and then i i research that record and say what keyboard did they use to make that sound yeah and then i go i go on a mad hunt for it like you know it took me maybe maybe five years till I found a Lindrum in a good enough condition, you know, cause sometimes those are pretty raggedy. So you have a Lindrum? Yeah, I got a Lindrum. I got here, let me show you if you can see. Good God. I got the, got the, uh, oh, behind. Behind. yeah. Lindrum and I got the drum the track. Profit, yeah. And I got a profit over here and I got about five Moogs. So, yeah, it's like a big toy store over here, man. I know. Every time you post pictures, I'm like, I want to be in that place with this man. <laughs> yeah. And this is just one room. Like, I have an ARP over there. I got some more Rollins. I got 106 over there. Then I have another room where I have my drums, bass, guitars, a uh, couple of more synthesizers, a Rhodes. So I had that in a room behind me. Nice. Another room, so. Yeah, man. Are you like, it's like, obviously you can get programs that have all those things and more and you could have one controller and no right. cool I, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I have that. I have that too. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but you like, you like the stuff. Yeah. I, li I like being able to touch the stuff. Yeah, man. You know, I, like, I like the tactile surface of the being able to touch something. Tactile surface. And turn something, move it, you know, really, really, it, you know, be involved with it more yeah. than just moving a mouse. What have you been working on? I've seen you've been working on stuff. What anything in particular? Yeah, I got a couple of I got a couple of movies I'm working on. Fantastic. Uh, I have like some some Netflix things I'm doing. Slowly getting back into working on some new T double stuff. Oh, good. Some of my, some of my own stuff, you know, because I was sick for I'm still sick, but I was really I was really sick for a while about it, you know, a year ago. Yeah. So it kind of just I stopped all the T double stuff. And I just kind of was living off of my publishing and royalties off of the licensing. Right. Can I really quickly, do you mind unzipping your jacket a little bit more so that that microphone doesn't hit the zipper? It makes oh, a okay. weird sound. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. I noticed. Uh, what, what is it that you're sick with? Um, I had kidney failure. Uh huh. So you so were going I, in for dialysis pretty much yeah, every I'm, day. I'm yeah. I'm still on dialysis. So I do dialysis three times a week, Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays. How are you feeling? I'm feeling a lot better now because my body has gotten used to dialysis, to being on that procedure. But at first, and still sometime now, but at first I was really tired. Sometime when I leave dialysis, I get real bad cramps, you know, where I can like kind of hardly walk. So when I get home, I have to like lay down for a few hours. Then, you know, after I start feeling better, I'll, I'll come up, you know, cause my studio's upstairs. So if I can't walk, then I can't get to the studio, right? Right. So I just rest a little bit, feel a little bit better, you know what I mean? Then come up here and get busy. Yeah. So my body, my body's used to it now, but it's still, it's still draining because you know dialysis is cleaning all your blood in your body, so it's circulating everything. So yeah. it's it's a hell of a procedure, but I'm on a transplant list, so I'm waiting on that, and so that's moving along. So everything is going good. I got good good doctors. Good. Good people around me. Uh, got good insurance. Thank good. God. Um, like I said, I'm. You know, I, all my all my records I've done over the years are paying dividends now. Good. So I don't I don't have to try to gig. I don't have to good. try to. You know, this whole this whole uh, COVID nineteen downturn for our economy here in Austin, as far as gigging and all that, hasn't really affected me that much because my revenue isn't made from live performances. Right. Right. So I'm I'm real I'm real lucky on that end. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, real lucky. Uh, so. 
Um, how have you been throughout the? I mean, do you have to do you have to kind of keep yourself away from others because your uh, health is compromised? Oh uh, yeah, I, I, de- I definitely don't do the big crowds. Um, if I go shopping, you know, I'm, I might go shopping every once in a while, but that's more like in and out. Yeah. And I do a lot of Instacart. Yeah. I have the groceries delivered, but I don't, you know, I've been invited to a lot of shows and different things. I just, I just don't mess with it. I just don't play with it. I'm like, it wouldn't be good for me to be out hanging out like that. Cause not no. everybody's wearing a mask, right? Nope. Not everybody has taken their, like, like my mother used to say when she taught me how to drive, right? She's like, you can be the best driver, but not everybody else is. Right. Yeah. So you can stop, you can stop at every red light and somebody will still run into you. Yeah. So you have to be, I keep that in mind when I go places. So I just stay at home, man. And I'm lucky I have the studio here, so I don't yeah. have to go nowhere to do nothing. Yeah. So, yeah, but it's, it's been, I've been all right, man. Good. Good. Thanks. Uh, so, man, over the last, I guess, almost month now, or three weeks or four weeks since, uh, since Memorial Day, yeah. there's been a, a real change, I feel. In the general, even even more than like the week after Memorial Day, I feel like now I feel like. Do you feel after seeing so many protests and what I would call like kind of mini awakenings, right? Uh, do you feel like this one, this time, things are moving? Um, well, you know, I'm I'm born and raised in Austin, right? Okay, and I've seen these type of shifts you know maybe 10 times 15 times where something starts moving yeah and then it fizzles out and yeah every you know and 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 of course that was before social media right like social media really helped it this time around where everybody's online everybody's pushing it i feel this time it could be it could last longer it could be a better impact because more people are involved and more people are the younger generation, right? Like younger, younger folks are saying, Hey, you know, this isn't cool. And now they kind of have a, a support team where now they can talk to their parents about race. Now they can talk to their grandparents about race. Now they can talk to their friends about race. Now the conversation is a little bit more open and not so much in the shadows now, which I think is, which I think is great and amazing, right? Because everybody should, should be treated equally, should be treated fairly should get the same amount of respect, no matter who you are, what you look like, any of that. And and now I think because of the way, you know, the pandemic is and a lot of other stuff, a lot of different ethnicities and races are kind of getting treated the same way. So some people are starting to kind of see, oh, well, that's kind of how black people were kind of feeling with it. You know, like people with, with, who don't want to wear a mask. Why am I being discriminated against? Why can't I shop here? Right. 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 It's kind of like you think, you know, when black people couldn't go into certain stores and buy because their skin color, you know, that's dumb. Right. Yeah. So I think people are kind of equating the two. They're trying, they're trying to put it together now. And I think it's it's really becoming a real beautiful thing where if we keep the momentum going. Yeah. We can make some things happen. Now, if, you know, everybody has a short attention span because of the social media era where people will be excited for a couple of months like we've been and then the new thing will come and everybody will kind of forget about this. That's what I'm kind of worried about. That's yeah. That's the thing that I, I w- would hope that this energy would carry on at least through the election, not just on a presidential yeah. level, but on a local level where people will start putting into place totally. different minded people. I agree on purpose. I agree. Yep. Man, let me ask you a question. I, I want to talk about your history here, but I know you do you do mentoring. You right. you talk to young artists. Yep. And when you're talking to someone, just basically on a, on a scene level, on an Austin music scene level, mm-hmm. if you talk, if you're t- like, what is the, what would you tell a young black artist that you wouldn't tell a young white artist? or wouldn't have to tell a young white artist. Right. Um. Mm, that's that's kind of kind of a tough one because a lot of artists, almost all artists are kind of in the same boat now. You know what I mean? Like they're trying to make a living. They're trying to, you know, break out of the scene. They're trying to become that next thing. I think with black art, what I tell black artists is, especially with hip hop and like R and B, I tell a lot of them that our genre of music is like punk rock, right? You have to think outside the box. You always got to be thinking 
over here and not following the mainstream and not following Billboard, not following Rolling Stones, not following those things, but sticking over here, creating your own thing. And it might take a while, but the stars always align. You know what I mean? Like eventually it'll, it'll shine on you where what you're doing will be that thing. Cause that's kind of like how I was, right? I, I went my own route when a lot of people were doing this other thing. I was like, let me try this licensing thing. Let me try building the T double brand. Let me try to do this. And a lot of people thought I was crazy doing it. You know, like when I did my, uh, my black mics matter mm -hmm. album that I did like four years ago, right? When I did that record, everybody's like, that's, that's a dumb idea. Why would you do something like that? But I looked at it as being like Austin's Marvin Gaye, let's get it on capturing a moment in time of what's happening. And here we are again, with that same energy happening again. So that project was very relevant. Yeah. So you have to think ahead. You have to be a forward thinking person. And so I always tell young, young black artists, you know, don't get discouraged. Don't think you live in Austin and there's no place for you to do hip hop or R and B. A lot of black artists say, I live in Austin. It's a white city. There's no place for me to do what I do, but there is, you just got to make your own, you got to chisel out your own space. And you'll respect your craft more after you get through chiseling it out, you know, because I'm born and raised here. I've never moved away to New York, L.A., Atlanta and tried to do a career there. But I've had a very successful career being here in Austin, probably more successful than quite a few rock artists that live here. Yeah. You know, what I mean, so just, you know, just think outside the box. Don't try to follow other genres, create your own your own lane, so to speak. Do you, so you would, there's no, do you, basically what I'm speaking to is like what we saw Jackie stand up against. Right. Uh, last week, Jackie Benson, when she basically was like, hey, you know, on, on this festival, there's not been a, a, any black artists, yeah. a black headliner since 2016 mm -hmm. or yep. whenever that was. I, I might right. be getting the date wrong. Are those, I mean, what do you attribute that to? Like, what is the whiteness of Austin and where do you go? I mean, I understand that you, I mean. I think, I think more, I think th those type of situations when artists aren't getting booked. Yeah. Is, it's not from a, a lack of a white promoter not liking hip hop or not liking black artists. I think it's just not being connected. There's no community connection. They don't know who's doing what. Right. Because in Jackie's thing, when they were talking about that, they were saying, where there's no, there's no black artist big enough to headline. Yeah. Besides maybe two groups, which is which is false. There's tons of bands here who are doing great things, who are selling records, who are touring at the time, who are doing amazing things. They just don't know about it. So right. I think they needed to bring somebody in, and that person could be Jackie or whoever. They need to bring somebody in who's plugged in to this side of the tracks, so to speak, to say, hey, these guys over here are doing great things. Book them. Like, I don't think... You know, having an all black blues on the green festival thing is amazing. It should have happened years ago. Right. Right. But I think it should have happened because the talent required it. Right. Not because the pressure was applied. Right. Right. And it became a, and it became a branding marketing disaster and they yep. had to do something fast. That's how I looked at it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So they were kind of, oh, what do we do? What do we do? Like, OK, let's let's do an all black one now. It should have it should have happened a long time ago. I'm glad Jackie stood up like that. Like I've done that too for shows. There's there's venues that were around where I said, your dress you won't allow certain people in because of their dress code on a Saturday or on the weekend. I'm not playing there on a on a on a Wednesday. I'm not playing there on a Thursday. And I know a lot of artists can't do that because they haven't a you know amassed the ability to, to sustain themselves yeah. without a gig. And that and that's where it gets tricky where they're like, this venue might be racist, right? They might have an overly racist tone about their place, but they're willing to pay you $50. You're not getting booked anywhere else. So you might say, uh, I guess I'll overlook it tonight. But I look at it like, if you do that gig that way, they'll keep doing that. Yeah. And they'll never, they'll never give you, your genre, or anybody that looks like you that level of respect because they'll be like, oh, we're just getting $50 and they don't care what we put online. Where I would be like, no, I'm not playing, I'm not playing your show. And I've been offered you know, thousands of dollars to play gigs and I'm like, I'm not doing it. I'd rather stay at home. And yeah. that's why I kind of stopped performing so heavy because right. I just couldn't put myself out there just just to be rapping. You know what I mean? Like I I, I I treasure who I am. I treasure my craft more. 
I treasure my fan base and my community that a lot of people look at me to be a leader. So I'm very cautious of what I do. Even with my nephews, my nephews look at my Facebook and Instagram and they see what I do. So I always try to be positive so they can see it and be like, okay, Uncle T stood up for so-and-so and for himself, okay, now I can do it too. So I have a lot of eyes on me. So I have to be real conscious of what I do. I just can't be running around like, you know, being crazy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Can I tell you something? One of the things that, one of the reasons why I've always really liked you is just that thing that you said that you, your nephews, like, hey man, I got to, I got to be a stand-up guy for my nephews. You're a very, oh. very human person. I got to be, always, man. I've always appreciated that, man. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's weird because uh, the 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 hip hop scene here, as I, as I remember it, like as far as I know, like in the '90s, I know there must have been more guys, but I only know about you, Donnell, and like Smackola, right? Or Smack now, right? But, <laughs> yeah, I mean that's. But the hist- you know, what I mean that's the thing is like the history of hip hop in urban music in Austin is so vast you know what i mean like i'm probably one of the more well-known components of it uh-huh. but there were guys doing it before me you know right, there right. was like there was like project crew and Cooley girls and papa chuck and quince and lady ic and mckb and these guys were putting out records like they were they were selling out shows on the east side before we even went to sixth street mc overlord was the first one to break up at sixth street and that was with Vallejo, right? Yeah, and, and Steamboat. And, and Steamboat, he was doing yeah, yeah. All that stuff, yeah. So Overlord was the first one to break that open. But on the east side, I probably made more money as a teenager than I probably did as an adult rapping downtown. Yeah. Because we had hundreds and thousands of people would come to our shows, and we were teenagers, and everybody's putting out records. Everybody was supporting it. you know. And you can even go back further to, I think, in the 50s with DJ Hepcap. He was the DJ. I think he was on... K vet, one of those stations that was here, and he he used to he used to talk jive between baseball games, so he would play records, and then he would talk a little jive while he's changing the records. Yeah, you know, and then he put out a book called Hep Cat's Jive, and you know, and he was I think he was like the first black DJ I don't know in the nation, but definitely in Texas. DJ, so wow. the black music goes way, way back. You know what I mean? You, I mean, you have a great knowledge of this, and I've never really known too much about it do you mind going into like as far as like like how old were you when you became aware of of a rap scene in austin or a hip-hop scene in austin oh and man, what year probably, was it oh my god um probably around i was like eight years old wow because there were you know because i went to maplewood elementary and there was already guys who moved here from like new york and uh-huh. other places and they were break dancing and rapping and they were doing all this cool stuff. And I was like, damn, that's, you know, what is that? That's kind of cool. So I went to the mall one time with my mom and there used to be a store called, uh, it might even call Spencer's, maybe yeah. Spencer's, I think. And um, I bought a book called uh, Hip Hop Lingo or something like that. And it had all these rap, had all these rap phrases in it, right? I was like, I'm going to learn this. What is this? But that was first time where I was like, okay, this is cool. So at eight, I got I got hip to the music. My dad started buying me and my brother records, uh-huh. right? Cause we lived in, we lived in front of a record store, so he knew the owner, so he would bring records. Where was the what, what part of town was that in? It was off of Maina Road, kind of like Maina Road and Airport at that time. Oh, okay, there, yeah. There was there used, to, there used to be a short stop kind of on the corner. There's like a it's a car dealership now. Yeah. And, but there was a record store further down, and my dad knew that guy. So he would always bring records, and we would hang out with. I would hang out with him in the record store, and so we started getting these hip hop records and Africa Bambada, and yeah, all this stuff, you know. And around that time, you know, as I got a little older, the breakdance movie started coming out, breaking, breaking one, breaking two, Beat right. Street, Wild Style, and I was like, man, this is cool. So when I was eight, I told my mom, I was like, look, I think I want to do this music thing. I think that's my calling. Right. And she was like, OK, well, it keeps me out the street. Right. It keeps me from the bad crowd. So I said, I want a keyboard. So that Christmas, she bought me a keyboard 
And then the next year is when I mailed my first demo to Warner Brothers. Records. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cause you so saw it on what, the back of the Prince album. Yeah. I'm never yeah, so going to forget what, that story. Yeah. So that's when that story, so that's when that part of my life just skyrocketed then. Yeah. But then as I got older, then I started, I started meeting, you know, I went to Reagan high school and that's where I met a uh, Papa Chuck and Who's he eventually that? signed. He's a, he, he was a local rapper here and he signed to, he was like Austin's first major label rap artist. Okay. He signed to Relativity Records, which had Lords of the Underground, yeah. Yeah. Play, yeah. Uh, all them. He signed to them. And so I went to high school with him. So every time I would see him, I'd be like, I want to battle you. I want to battle you. Cause that's how you did in hip hop, right? right let's right, battle, right, let's battle. Right. And he would blow me off and he just introduced me to his DJ Casanova, who was a hot DJ at a Catfish Station which was the only black club on 6th Street. They used to have a line down the street, Catfish Station. And Casanova kind of took me under his wing. And he was like, I'm going to teach you how to produce. I'm going to teach you how to structure your songs. I'm going to teach you how to, you know, for free. Because he just saw I had that drive. I was like, I want to learn what you're doing. Because he was already getting publishing. He was touring. His group project crew was like Austin's biggest group at the time. So it was like, this whole energy was going on and I was right there in the middle of it as a young kid, like soaking it up, like teach me. Was that in the eighties? The Yeah, that was an eighty. That okay. was that was around Project Crew was I think was around eighty six, I think, eighty five, eighty six, somewhere around there when they started uh it's very early on. Yeah. So they, they did about two or three albums and then you had the Cooley Girls, which was Austin's first real female group. Uh, then you had Candy Fresh, who went to Reagan High School with me as well. She signed to Two Sweet Records, which was founded by a Fresh Kid Ice from Two Live Crew. Oh wow! Okay. And Two Live Crew had um, they had a, a a store on 12th Street called Miami Bass, where they sold speakers and records. And so every Sunday, I would go there. I would have my mom drop me off there, and I would play them my demo tapes. I'd make a new song take it there every Sunday trying to get a record deal with them. So Austin has a lot of amazing things. So when people talk about Austin doesn't really have hip hop and nothing really happened, they they just don't know. Like there's tons of stories, tons of things right. where artists are doing amazing stuff. M my knowledge of hip hop is pretty limited. Right. I've always been in the rock world and mm -hmm. but I I've, I've watched this uh hip hop evolution documentary series on Netflix since it's come yeah. out. Yeah. And there was one thing that I did notice that Austin never really as far as I know had a sound. Mm -hmm. Did it? Right. Has it? No. Cuz that's, that's the one thing that's defined all those scenes. There's like a specific yeah. fucking everyone's using the same drum machine or everyone's yeah. going off of these records. Houston Houston has their own sound, right. New York whatever. Miami. But I think I think I think that's what makes it beautiful about Austin is we don't, right? So everybody can sound so different but like like I said all the groups I mentioned earlier when I was coming up. Yeah. None of them sounded alike. But they were all fucking amazing. Yeah, yeah. Like if you heard a Project Crew record you knew that was Claymo rapping. If you heard the Cooley Girls, you knew that was Erica. You, if you heard Lady I C K B, you knew that. If you heard Papa Chuck, you knew it was him. You were never confused by the song that was playing. Yeah. You never think, God, that sounds like so and so. It was always an individual sound. Right. And that's what I came up in. So I always try to make sure that my music, my personal music, doesn't sound like anybody else's. Right. And if I make a song that sounds like somebody else. I'll sell it to somebody else or <laughs> call I'll that person it. up and see if they yeah. want it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Hey, I got something that sounds perfect for you, but that's, but that's the beautiful part though of Austin is we don't sound like anybody else. And that's also the crutch. Yeah. Because labels want something that sounds familiar right, to right. sell to the masses. So when they come here, they're like, you guys are amazing, but we can't do nothing with it. Just like, um, you know, Def Jam records, right? Like Russell Simmons label with, with, and all that. Well, they had the Def Jam South, which was in Atlanta. Right. And Scarface from Houston was the president, and he signed Ludacris, right? But a lot of you don't know, Def Jam South was in Austin first. Oh, really? And they were here. It was a guy named Keir Worthy. He was the first hip-hop guy to work for South by Southwest. Huh. And he was here looking for bands. Like, I was one of the young guys. He was kind of grooming to, to, to be on Def Jam. Right. But I just wasn't ready. And he, you know, and a lot of the bands here 
we were too raw. It would have took too much work to kind of chisel us because we didn't have a scene, right? Like you could go to other places and they already got an infrastructure. Right, right. To mature those bands. We didn't have that. So he left Austin and then he went to Atlanta. Then that's where they got Scarface. They signed Ludacris and Ludacris became the big artist he is today. But Def Jam South was started in Austin first. Wow. Uh, yeah, that's what I was going to say is like, how did how did you find out about these bands like in 85 and 86? Like, was there a place you could go see them? Did they do? Yeah, well, a lot a lot of the bands you could see like, you know, Juneteenth was a big way to find new bands. Because okay. there was always performances. Uh, you could go to Givens and there was always be bands performing. And with me being a little kid, I would either be with my mom or with my brother. Right. And I would just gravitate towards the music and be like, damn, who's that rapping? Like, who is that? And I would go up to them and be like, hey, my rep, my old rap name used to be Whistle T before I became T-Double. <laughs> okay. And I would go to them and say, hey, I'm Whistle T. Uh, I rap. And they'd be like, oh, good to meet you, kid, right? Because I'm just a little youngster. Good to meet you, kid. And every time I saw them, hey, remember me? Whistle T. Yeah. Okay, okay. Then eventually they were like, man, what do you do? And I was like, man, I rap. And they were like, let me hear it. And I was always good with the freestyling. Yeah. So I would always freestyle and be like, man, you know, come to a show, come sit in with us, you know, come get on stage. And that's just kind of how I worked my way in there. And it was a, it was a good network of groups. Like a lot of groups were already making records. So they would say, Hey, come, you want to go to a show? Come carry my records. Like I carried a lot of rappers records to get into the show just so I could see how that works. Yeah. I've been at shows where Papa Chuck would come and everybody would stop what they're doing because he, at that time, he was like our rock him. He was like yeah, our yeah. LL Cool J. Yeah. When you saw him, you were like, oh, shit, let me give him the mic, right? Yeah. So to see that type of energy, you're like, damn, I want that. How do I get to that point? And Casanova was always like, hey, work hard. Come over here, sit in the studio. Like, I've been at Casanova's house when he's had the RZA from Wu-Tang over there. He's had uh, a lot of famous people, and I would just sit on the couch yeah. and just be there as the young guy and not talk. I wouldn't say, hey, I rap or listen to me rap. I would just sit there and soak up the game. And he would just say, you can come over anytime you want to. You can, you can use my equipment. You can whatever, but just sit there and be quiet when people are here. And that's how I got so much game from DJ Casanova. Like, we, we still talk today. Like, that's my, that's my big brother for real, man. Because he, he looked out for me at a time where I wasn't like other rappers, right? I wasn't trying to sound like I was from New York. I wasn't trying to sound like I was NWA, right? Gangster. I was more like, I just wanted to rhyme. I just wanted to rap. Just give me a beat and let me rap. And he was like, man, let, let's 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 work on that. Him and Andre Walker. Andre Walker is another another legend here. He did South by Southwest after Care Worthy. And Andre Walker did a lot of R and B showcases for South by Southwest. A lot of people don't know that part. We had a lot of R&B showcases, soul showcases back in the days, and Andre Walker did that as well. And then when he left South By, he brought me in. And that's when I got hired at South By. Okay, I didn't... Uh, how long did you work there? I worked for South By for about three and a half years, four years. What years were those? Uh, that was like, <clears throat> I believe, 97 to like 99, 97 to like 2000 maybe. Or ninety eight to two thousand, something like that. Right. So that was during the same year I got my record deal with Good Vibes out in L.A. Okay. While I was working for South by like a lot of things in my life are like intersecting, right? Like a lot. Of, I was re I'm one of the real lucky ones where a lot. I was I was in Austin at the right time with a lot of things happening. Like I worked for Arista Records when that was here. You know, we had the yeah, Arista yeah, yeah. office that was here. I worked there. With Cameron. Yeah, Cameron Randall. Yeah. Nice and at guy. the same time, I, at the same time, I was working at Arista. I was working at South by Southwest doing all the hip hop. And then this music conference called the Gavin, which is in San Diego, oh. South by Southwest was going to fly me out there to uh, be a South by Southwest rep and look for talent. But that was like the hip hop, the urban conference at the time. I went out there. I had a chance to rap. I got a record deal with Good Vibe Recordings, you know, and and because I worked at Arista Records, I kind of knew how to construct contracts. Yeah. So when I got my deal with Good Vibes, I got a label deal. I wasn't signed as an artist. So since I had a label deal, I came back to Austin and I signed Mirage, who was my childhood friend here, okay. to the label. So he got to own his masters and his publishing and all that type of stuff. 
but Cameron Randall was a a great dude, man. He um he took me in his office and was like, "What do you want to do?" You know, and I guess he thought I was gonna say, "You know, I want to rap over there." I said, "I want to run a label." Yeah, I want to have a label and sign. I want to sign all my friends to record deals. He was like, "Okay, interesting, interesting." And then every time an artist would come through, he would bring me in his office and just say, "Sit on the couch." And so I got to see how contracts were negotiated. And he gave me a he gave me a contract one time, like an old one, and said, "Take this home, read it, highlight what you think is good and bad about this contract, and bring it back tomorrow." I did that like homework. I did it, brought it back the next day. We sat in his office, and he was like, "That's right, that's wrong, that's right, that's wrong. This is a good term, that's a bad term, you know." And I was just a kid sitting there, just soaking it up, you know what I mean? So, I've been I've been lucky to have so many people to just pour that knowledge on me. That's why I try to give it back with Urban Artists Alliance and when I talk to young artists because these guys that have Kevin Randall didn't have to do that. Right. You know what I mean? Roland Swinson didn't have to take me in to work at work at South by Southwest because he didn't know me from anybody. You know what I mean? Like I didn't I didn't I didn't do a job application at South by Andre Walker just walked in with me one day and said, South by Southwest, I quit, but here's my here's the new guy. That's how I got the job. And I didn't even know we were going to South by Southwest that day. Andre just picked me up, said, let's go eat. He's like another big brother. I said, okay, so we went to eat. And he's like, let's go riding. Let's go for a ride. And we wound up at South by Southwest at that little house they used to be in. And he walked in and said, yo, Roland, I'm done. But here's my replacement. And I didn't even know I was going there to get a job. But that's I got my job at South by Southwest. That's awesome. So it's it's crazy, man. Um. I was going to ask you about uh, that label, Arista Austin, and right. there was also uh, BMG was here for a while. Remember that in the 90s? Yep. yep. And then there was one other one that was here. Uh, well, you said that the uh, Def Jam was here. Yeah. I have my own ideas about this, but why do you, why do you think that sort of like big industry doesn't work here? Mm. or hasn't worked here i think i think the the main reason it hasn't worked here because they haven't found a hit they haven't found a a string of hits right right because if like arista austin when that was here we basically did latin music we had a bunch of latin artists and we did sister seven we had sister seven right but we did a bunch of latin stuff right so that stuff was selling ahead of his time. Like if, if Aristotle was still here right now, it'd be huge because the Hispanic market is so big now. Right. Yeah. So it was kind of, it was kind of ahead of its thing, but labels, nobody here had really made a, a consecutive row of hits. It's kind of like the Austin curse in a way where you have these bands who come out like Gary has been able to kind of break that curse a little bit mm-hmm. where he's been able Spoon to put out multiple. To. Yeah. We've been able yeah. to put out multiple albums, get Grammys, yeah. do great things. Right. But now it's like, Who's next? And is there a next, right? What's going to be the next person? So labels labels are here in Austin. They're looking for people. They have reps come, but they're right. like, are the bands putting out enough music? Right. Do you have enough catalog? Right. Um, do you know enough about the business? Like labels aren't really into finding a young artist, tweaking them, shaping them, molding them, then putting them out. They want you to be damn near 80% ready to go when they get you. Yeah. And that's one thing that has slowed Austin is the education component, too. Well, we have tons of bands, but how many have their own websites? How many have their own publishing? ASCAP, BMI. How many know about royalties? How many know about owning their masters and publishings and, you know, the, 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 the rights of persona and all these other different terms and multiple rights deal? You know, how many of them know that? Very few. And very few want, want to learn. They yeah. really have somebody do that for them, and in turn, they give up big portions of their their ownership. And then when it's all said and done, nothing happens. They're like, "Damn, T, I lost everything because I thought this guy was going to be my way out, and it wasn't." Right. So it's a it's a bunch of contributing contributing factors, but I think the main thing is labels don't see radio hits. That's what sells. They're not trying to break a new. They're not breaking new artists anymore. Right. They're not doing that. They're not they're not trying to make find you as a youngster and make you into the next Michael Jackson. Right. 
they want you to damn near already be working on Thriller now. Right, right, yeah. And they just hop on the back of that. Yeah. Yeah, it took a lot of, like, no one really thinks about that. Like, there was, Michael Jackson was putting out records from the time he was five before he yeah. put out Thriller. Yep. Yep, they don't, they don't want to, they don't want to develop you. Just like Prince, like, I'm a big Prince fan, right? Like, yeah. you see the purple, you see the purplish light behind me. Yeah, yeah. purple over here. I'm a big, I'm a big Prince fan. Just like when they signed Prince as a youngster, they wanted to cultivate him because he was right. so talented. They they wanted to keep him until they could figure out what to do with him. Right. In, in and the, by the time, oh, sorry, go ahead. And by the time they figured out what to do with him, he already knew what he wanted to do. He yeah. was already controversy, dirty mind. Yeah. You know, 1999. You know, he was on his way. All they had to do was put out the records. Yeah. That's all they had to do was market it, make his videos, put out the records. Yeah, it seems like if they wouldn't have developed him and given him that, what was, 1999 was his fourth record? Yep. yep. Yeah, he would have been yep. dropped nowadays. Oh, yeah. He, he, would have been, he would have been dropped after the very first album <laughs> because his first album didn't have any hits on it. I wonder... It was, it was like his first album, if you go back and listen to it, it's like a long jam session. Yeah. The songs are just him jamming, showing out, like, I can play every instrument, watch this. Yeah. It wasn't nothing like radio, you know, yeah, nothing like that. You he know, was I still think a he, kid. I think, yeah, I think on that album, I think his his only hit on that album, I think, might have been "Soft and Wet." Yeah, and that got him a little bit of radio play, but that wasn't a big smash. Right. Until until his next album, where he did "Why You Want to Treat Me So Bad" and "I Want to I Be, be your, your Lover." lover. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I, I read somewhere that he said when he did "I Want to Be Your Lover," that's when he figured out the formula to writing hits. Because at first he was writing because he loved to write and create. But then the labels were like, we need a hit. So once he learned how to, I want to be your lover, it was off. He, he, couldn't st- he couldn't stop writing hits. Everything he wrote was a hit. Right. Insane. 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 Um, you're still, you're, you're a, a, a mentor at Black Fret, right? Yep. Um, wh- how, do you, how do you feel about the future of music? Like the guys that you're talking to and ladies that you're talking to, do you feel like... Because it's, it's, there's a lot of times when I do that thing with, with Austin Music Foundation, right. I do have my days of where I come out and I'm like, shit, man, this is, this right. is, this right. is all right. going to hell. But then other days right. I walk out and I'm like, oh, it's in really good hands. That right. very young person I, is yeah. dedicated. You know, I, I, feel, I feel hopeful when I talk to some of these artists, right? Because they know that they're in a, a good position now. Right now, like I tell them, the music industry is a level playing field now, right? Mm-hmm. Because nobody's touring. There's nothing big happening. So the labels have to rethink their whole format just like you do. So you're both thinking social media. You're both thinking live streaming. You're both thinking cash app, how to get funds from your performance. So you're thinking the same way. But with an independent artist, you have more freedom to do different things. You can try this one day. It doesn't work. You can flip it the next. A label, they got a marketing plan. They just say, we're going to promote you this way for three months. We're not changing this because we've had a meeting. We've agreed to the funding. This is what we're doing. So you're stuck into where if you're an independent, you can do a lot of other things. And, you know, and with Black Fret, you know, another positive thing is we give out so much money. Yeah. Right. So that keeps artists kind of hopeful and happy because they're like, oh, I'm going to get some money. But we try to help them better utilize the money. Because when you're, a, when you're an artist and you've never had, say, $20,000, you're probably going to blow it. You're probably going to want to go in a big studio, get a whole string section, hire all your friends, and before you know it, your grant is gone. Right. And then you're like, now you can't shoot a video, now you can't promote, now you don't have no, you know, so we try to tell them, the best ways to spend them. I've talked to some artists and I've been like, okay, you're a great touring band and you're doing amazing on the road. Fix your van. Yeah. Get a new starter in your van. Yeah. Right. Don't, don't go press up a bunch of CDs, like fix your van. That's where you're making your money at. Yeah. You know, fix your tires, you know? So you gotta, you gotta kind of come at them from a different perspective. And they listen to me more because I'm still an artist. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not some, you know, old right. guy who did it like in the seventies and telling right. them how we used to do it. I'm like, this is what I'm doing right now. So this is what you should be doing. This is what works for me. Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm real hopeful with the bands I'm talking to. And, you know, I, I did a couple of, uh, Austin music foundation mentoring things uh-huh. as well. 
And the guys that I talk to there, they still write me on Instagram and say, hey, I took your advice. This is what I did with it. And I'm like, awesome. Yeah. They're like, I, I was able to get this, this contract negotiated. And I saw there was a clause that you mentioned for me to watch out for. It's not in there anymore. And I'm like, that's what I'm talking about. Like, I like those type of emails and calls where people are hitting you back and like, yeah, yeah, you made sense. You were right when you told me whatever, whatever. So I'm, ho I'm, ho I'm hopeful about it. You know, I want to see artists not make the same mistakes I made yeah. coming up. Totally. Because I think when that happens, that's a travesty for the music scene. When, when artists are making mistakes that we made when we were like 15. Yeah. 17. Like they shouldn't. Or me like, when I was like 35 even. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like you're, you're in a new age of doing things. Like I tell artists all the time, I'm like, you have social media. You have so many things on your side that I didn't have. You know what I mean? You should be running circles around me and everybody else around here. You know, and, and tell them stop being lazy. You know, the thing about Austin, Austin can make you lazy. Yeah. It, you know, because we're not a bustling. We're not moving. We're, like, right. we're not like New York. Everything's going on. So you can sit back and be like, I'll get to it. I'll, right. I'll get around to it. And you never do. Yeah. Where, where me, I've always been a type like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it today. I'm on it. I check my emails. I do my social media. I build my own websites. I mix my own records. I put out my own records. I do all my own licensing administration. Uh, everything because I, that way I know it's getting done. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. And also, I mean, you keep up, you keep your overhead realistic and you yeah. know how to work it. You're smart enough and, and, and into it enough. Can I just quickly, is that a Ghostbusters jumpsuit? Yeah. yeah, it is. yeah it is. <laughs> Hold on. Let me show you. The that is the coolest man. <laughs> All right. Sorry to yeah. take you out of that. Um, it's all right. Uh, how, uh, what, about, uh, what about the current scene of hip-hop? Mm -hmm. How do you, or who are your guys, or what do you go see? What do you... I, think, I think the current scene is it's starting to bubble back up again because a lot of these artists are relying on performing. Right. And there's nowhere to perform now. So... They really got to put their brains on the table and say, how can I do this? Because you can live in Austin and have a career somewhere else. Yeah. So you don't have to say, I'm not doing anything in Austin, so I'm done. There are other markets for you to tap into. Sure. You know, and, and with streaming, you know, it's every artist should be streaming something. Should yeah. be doing something with your music. You know, whether it's you showing how to make a beat, whether you're a rapper and you like to knit Maybe show somebody a video of you knitting something, you know, something shocking, something different where people will see it and be like, oh, shit, I didn't know he likes to knit. Yeah, yeah. That, that's cool. Like where people can relate to you and not make it so sterile. Yeah. Like, hello, I'm about to rap. You'd be like, OK, you know, because I was I did a couple of live streams over here where I was making beats and I yeah. was showing people my gear in the studio and yeah. people really dug it. They were like, man, that's awesome. They were like, that's cool. So I might I might get back to doing that again. But, you know, it all depends on how I'm feeling on certain days. Yeah. But the, the scene here is is bubbling. Um, there's tons of rappers. There's tons of guys who are doing amazing things. And like I said, the blues on the green thing, if that that can morph into something else. Yeah. Like I was I would like to see a lot of that city funding and city partnership grow with the Urban Music Fest. Because the Urban Music Fest is basically the black blues on the green yeah right yeah and i need to, i'd rather see the city put more effort into that entity so that can sustain itself and we don't have to keep going to these other festivals saying can you book us right right yeah we have another entity that's funded that's paying artists that's promoting us all those things over there well they can they can partner together so it's it's doable i think that's a, that's a conversation that needs to be had as well yeah are you? Are, do you do stuff with the city? Are you part of the music commission, or have you been? Yeah, I was. I'm, I've never been on the music commission, but I was part of the um, equity, uh, diversity, and inclusion uh -huh. committee, where it was maybe about fifteen of us got together and and just talked about the issues in Austin and how to move things along. And the thing with the city is like when you get into government, things move slow, and you have to ask a lot of people's permission before you can do something like, you know, if there's a million dollars sitting around 
and it would be perfect for what you do, you have to ask a bunch of people how you can get to that money. Yeah. And then once you say you want that money, another entity will say, hey, oh, there, there's a million over there? Well, we want some of that too. Yeah. And then it becomes a big old thing about who writes the better business plan, who has the better connections at the city to yeah. get that. And it just becomes a headache. You know, that's why I've never really pushed to be on much of those committees because I like the freedom of I can wake up, right. I can spend whatever amount of money I want to on whatever. Like a few weeks ago, you know, I gave like a thousand dollars away to first responders. Uh-huh. Right. Because I was like, you know, they're working hard. They don't have the mask and the protections and they're out yeah. there. They're not getting paid what they want. So I said, I'm, I'm giving, you know, a thousand dollars away. You know what right. I mean? Ten, ten first responders, I'm giving a hundred dollars away. Right. If I, and if I was with the city, it would have took forever just to be able to get that thousand right. to do that. So I just like the freedom of being able to be T-double when I want to be T-double. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, I really respect that. So. Yeah, I have. Um, okay, so wait a minute. What about any artists in particular that you think have come out in the last couple of years in hip-hop in Austin that people should check out? I think people should definitely check out Quinn NFN. Um, he's, he's a young guy from here in Austin. He just signed a deal with... the. Uh, universal universal records uh-huh. i think through a, through a sub a subsidiary label okay. and his videos are like a million plus views like he's killing and he was on the cover of the chronicle they did a they did their last hip-hop cover had the tita who's really who's good kenny g was on that cover and quinn and all three of them were on the cover of the chronicle together and i think when that i think when that cover came out that's when they should have done a blues on the green type of hip yeah. hop thing. Yeah. Cause then it was, it was impactful for hip hop. Right. They've had, they've, they've had, they've had like all the, the soul singers on the cover before, like the female soul singer, like Tamika Jones, Alicia, Alicia Lani, Lani, all Mayla, them. They've had yeah. like that, that should, that should have been a show. Yeah. So there's been opportunities to attack it and embrace it. And it's kind of been glazed over, but right. those guys are really killing it right now. They're really working hard and, you know, my thing with with artists is I just hope contracts are structured long term because now music industry careers die so fast and soon you'll wake up one day. You don't have anything going on and you don't have any royalties come in. You don't have any publishing. You don't have any yeah. licensing, no sync. I hope those things are in place for these artists as well. Yeah. You know, because that's what's paying off for me now, because when I got really sick, I couldn't do anything. Right, but I was still making publishing. I was still yeah. getting royalties. I was still getting sync money. You know, the things that I did prior are paying off now. So I hope that these artists have somebody who supports them, not not because they're getting a commission from them, right? Yeah. But somebody who's really on their team yeah. who really cares about them and says, "Hey, man, like I, I talk, I talk to some of the artists. I'm like, hey, here's my view. Here's my opinion of what you should do." This is just free game. Now go do whatever. Yeah. So. Hmm. But the scene, the the scene is, is happening. Um, a lot of a lot of the rappers, like I said, they're they're, they're punk rock. They're finding their own ways of getting online and doing their own thing. Where now, companies are coming to look for them because, like I said, Quinn has a million plus views. It's Other so artists are, are are racking up a bunch of views. Like, they're doing they're doing a lot of things now. So. Yeah. As long as they keep that, mo- it's all about momentum. Yeah. As long as you keep forward momentum and sustainability, you'll be all right with whatever you're doing. Right. Don't try to chase anybody. Don't try to look to your right because you're, you know, who's running with you. Just do your own thing. Yeah. And and it'll happen. It'll work. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm proof of that. You yeah. Know what I mean, like I've I've never chased any other artists in Austin ever. I just did my own thing. Yeah. And I've always been at the right place, the right time, doing the right thing. Yeah. So, yeah, I feel like that too. I feel like I've always been a guy that doesn't follow what's happening in the. I mean, I'm involved, but not try artistically to. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Because when you, you know, especially when you make music, right? Like when you make your music, like I have people coming to me now who are, are listening to songs on albums I did years ago and saying, hey, I heard you on Breaking Bad. Heard your song on Breaking Bad and when I researched you and I found some of your older stuff and it's amazing. And, your, 
X, X amount of songs keep me going during the day because they're motivational or yeah. whatever, yeah. you know, and, and I, I write the songs for that moment of how I'm feeling, not knowing that it's going to affect other people. Right. But it does because it's, it's authentic. It's pure. Um, I don't try to be that big rapper guy yeah. around town. You know what I mean? I don't try to do that. I just do my music. Yeah. You know, and I, and I, and I try to help artists and, you know, try to keep the energy positive, man. Yeah. Yeah, you've always been great at that. I have to tell you something. Last time I saw you was at this party at, uh, what's David Messier's studio? Oh, Same Sky. Same Sky Studios. There was a party there. And I think that must have been almost like a year ago or something. Mm -hmm. But your energy and your eyes are much more lit. I can can tell now that you were feeling bad then. Yeah. No, I was like, like at at that point I was, I, I was like, Man, because that's right when my kidneys were yeah. going out. You, yeah, you so didn't. Like, you didn't seem like comfortable standing there, and I mean yeah, so physically. Like, yeah. Yeah. So I had I had like you know pain, I, you know s- swelling on my legs. Like yeah, yeah. I had a lot of stuff going on, but I was still out and about, right, to like see people and do stuff. But you know, it's like I've lost thirty pounds. <clears throat> I've lost thirty pounds since I started treatment. I feel better. I don't have a lot of pressure on my heart. It's great. And it's like. I'm feel, I'm feeling good, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I, I do I do feel better, you know what I mean? Yeah, your energy is is uh is much more up. I'm very yeah. happy to see that. Yeah. Um and yeah, man, and I know I, we and I love and I love oh, and I love David, man. I I, yeah. I love Same Sky and a little plug for him. He worked with the Grammys. Yeah. And I don't know if you saw it, but they put together the PDF for the coronavirus for studios. Yes. With like guidelines and I th- I think it's pretty awesome. I think everybody should check that out. Is he still the president of the chapter or he's moved on? No, I don't. I think he's, he's I think he's a trustee now. Trustee. Are you part of the Grammy? No, I'm not a, I'm not on the board. <laughs> I'm no. just joking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not I'm not I'm not on the board. It, it was it was fun being on there for 2 years and to be, you know, the first rapper from Austin on the Grammy board, right? Yeah. yeah. And to come from the east side of Austin yeah. and to make it up to the Grammy board and really have a, a voice to help move things along to make things happen. You know what I mean? So I enjoyed that experience and I take every experience and I learn from it and I move forward. One thing about me is I never sit back and, and rely on past things. Like when I got my stuff in Breaking Bad, everybody was like, oh, that's huge. Yeah. Right? Like, how big can you get past that? It's like, and I was what's like, next? I get, yeah, I was like, I can get bigger. Yeah, I can get better. Like, that was a good moment. Now let me move forward. Right. And I've had some great things since then. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, man. I've been, I've been, like I said, man, my story is a unique one because I've been a part of so many things in Austin. You know, I was the first only, really, the only hip-hop artist to record on Antone's records because I, I recorded on the Beth on the Fair Lanes album, uh-huh. Salsified. Which was on, um, which was on Dose Records, and Dose was distributed this, through Antones. Right. So, I'm the only rapper who's ever rapped on Antones Records, the blues label. So, yeah. Hey, I guess I could stop there for one. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's cool. still more. I know there's still yeah. more, and your uh, your drive and constant constant challenging of yourself artistically yeah. is something that's kept you moving forward. So totally. I'm uh, I'm always I'm always glad to talk to you, man. I'm glad you're feeling better. You look a lot Thank better. You. Thank you. Thank uh, you when this is over, I do want to come into that room. Hell yeah, and man. do something. You are, you are welcome to, man. You are welcome to. Yeah. Well, um, I'll put links to all your stuff. And I'll actually, I'll put, I'll put up our first talk, a uh, link to that. Oh, if, okay. people, if people after this, they want to hear a little bit more. Because I always, I always got a lot of that. That Prince story reminded me of how great that conversation was. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it, Johnny, yeah. man. Man, Always good talking to you, bro. I got nothing but love for you, man. Nothing but love for you either, man. I uh, I really appreciate you. I'm glad you're out there, and I'm glad you're feeling good and being healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, man. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. All right, man. Love you, brother. Bye. Man, I'm just bringing them back. 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 I see it up black in my city for never being whack while I spit these words. I'm traveling through. 
time I'm redesigning your birth and reconnecting your hook with realigning your nerve. But so search the crates, ship them across states till they reach their destiny next to me. It's on a turntable spin cycle. I ain't started making beats before I've been nitro. Ain't no fly by night flow. Uh-uh. Man, I use out of orbit voices every time I broadcast. broadcast. Hard hat visit. I put your wax in the construction while I'm improving the form of structure. I get a piece of paper, write that. Right. And then I find a melody, put a bass line beside that. Focus eyes at, play record, sing. Man, this is how to be the thing. Thing. Run. Man, I'm just bringing it back. Man, I'm just bringing it back. Beats. Man, I'm just bringing it back. Man, I'm just bringing it oh. back. Oh, oh, stop. Man, I'm just bringing it back. Man, I'm just bringing it back. Hip hop. Man, I'm just bringing it back. On a coward who devour good airtime for a minute to dead air. Really wasn't no skills nope. there. Ten albums still here. Right here. Well positioned, plus making the moves is the mission. But times change like days and moving minutes. My headphones strapped on, vocal pitch shifting in it. Is it real pinching? While it's throbbing from the low end. Friends came out the sewer when I blew up. I threw the fire to a See my kinetic crew is up, we heavy zingers. And we so deadly with the flow, dead ringer for a pro. Each time you gonna blow, blow. But of course I'm nice with the flow. Flawless when I go. See my jaws mechanical. So I keep it tight. And when I'm writing, so the speakers I won't bite in. And leave marks like my logo. Feel the vibe like vinyl. Get it, Brian. Man, I'm just bringing it back. Man, I'm just bringing it back. Beats. Man, I'm just bringing it back. 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 You see, I speak with a southern drawl. When I brawl, there are no rules. Compete in the hottest heat with no shoes. Those dudes got ahead of the line standing. I'm ahead of my time gambling, placing these chips and scanning. I'm seeing who's really down for the dude. Cause when this dude lose, who's really coming through? I'm so sick and tired, man. I'm so tired of you. You and rap fake persona. Stop pretending you're cool. Stop Go back to the lab, mend your wounds. My mood changes like a ring with deeper hues. You better up, race around and get some deeper dudes. Yeah, I peach your mood. My lyrics leak the ooze. Over dad at this. I make the rap split after this. Get the camera up, flashy click. See, I sprinkle the streets like confetti from my loose sleeve. T double watch me coming freak beats. Yeah, Ron. Man, I'm just bringing them back. Man, I'm just bringing them back. Beats. Man, I'm just bringing them back. Man, I'm just bringing them back. Stop. Man, I'm just bringing them back. Man, I'm just bringing them back. Hip hop. Man, I'm just bringing them back. Man, I'm just bringing them back. Rhymes. Man, I'm just bringing them back. Man, I'm just bringing them back. Beats. Man, I'm just bringing them back. Man, I'm just bringing them back. Stop. Man, I'm just bringing them back. Man, I'm just bringing them back. Hip hop. Man, I'm just bringing them back. Man, I'm just bringing them back.